Welcome to the People Who Read People podcast with me, Zach Elwood. This is a podcast aimed at better understanding other people and better understanding ourselves. You can learn more about it at behavior-podcast.com. If you like this podcast, please share it with your friends and family. The more listens and reviews it gets, the more I'll be encouraged to work on it. I think we'd all likely agree that meaning is very important to us humans. We want to feel like we live in a stable world where certain things are associated with certain other things. We like conceptual stability. Things being chaotic and unpredictable can be threatening to us. We also like to feel like our lives have meaning, however we define that. We like to feel like we're engaged in things that matter. On this episode, I talked to Stephen Heine about how humans react to our sense of meaning being threatened. What happens when our mental frameworks of how the world works don't hold up and things seem chaotic? What happens when our sense of what's meaningful in our lives is threatened? Stephen and his colleagues have proposed a theory they call the meaning maintenance model. A 2006 paper by Stephen and his colleagues, Travis Prohl and Kathleen Voss, was titled The Meaning Maintenance Model on the Coherence of Social Motivations. I'll quote from the abstract of that paper. The meaning maintenance model proposes that people have a need for meaning, that is, a need to perceive events through a prism of mental representations of expected relations that organizes their perceptions of the world. When people's sense of meaning is threatened, they reaffirm alternative representations as a way to regain meaning, a process termed fluid compensation. According to the model, people can reaffirm meaning in domains that are different from the domain in which the threat occurred. Evidence for fluid compensation can be observed following a variety of psychological threats, including most especially threats to the self, such as self-esteem threats, feelings of uncertainty, interpersonal rejection, and mortality salience. People respond to these diverse threats in highly similar ways, which suggests that a range of psychological motivations are expressions of a singular impulse to generate and maintain a sense of meaning. End quote. Here's some information about Stephen Heine from his professor page on the University of British Columbia website. He is Distinguished University Scholar and Professor of Social and Cultural Psychology at the University of British Columbia. His research has challenged key psychological assumptions in self-esteem, meaning, and the ways that people understand genetic constructs. He is the author of many journal articles and books in the field of social and cultural psychology, including Cultural Psychology, the top-selling textbook in the field. In 2016, he was elected as a Fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, end quote. Stephen is also currently working on a book with the working title, Navigating the Absurd, the Science of Existentialism, to be published by the publisher Basic Books. In this episode, Stephen and I talk about threats to meaning and how we handle that. We talk about political polarization and how that might be related to threats to meaning. We talk about existential crises, like the so-called midlife crisis and adolescent angst. We talk about examples of threats to meaning from our own lives. We talk about the anxiety that having a lot of freedom and choice can paradoxically have for us. And we talk about the theoretically positive aspects of having one's worldviews and meaning thrown off kilter, as can happen when things cause us to update our perceptions of the world, or, for example, with psychedelics. Okay, here's the talk with Stephen Heine, last name spelled H-E-I-N-E. Hi, Stephen. Thanks for coming on. Hi, Zach. Thanks a lot for having me on. So in your meaning maintenance paper from 2006, you start out by talking about a 1949 study that involved switching the colors of playing card suits and seeing how people reacted to that. So maybe you could talk a little bit about that study and how that relates to the meaning maintenance model. Sure. That's, uh, it's, it's one of my favorite studies um, by Jerome Berner and Leo Postman. Yeah, back in 1949. They did something very, very simple in the study. They, um, they showed their participants, university students, uh, some playing cards, one after another, and they just asked the people, what card do you see? They added a, a, a key unexpected element to this, to the study. Beforehand, they painted over the colors on these playing cards with a very still hand so that they changed the, um, uh, the colors of the hearts and diamonds to black and the color of the uh, spades and clubs to red, at least for some of these cards. And it was very curious what happened when they showed people these, these anomalous cards because the first reaction of almost everybody was that they, they didn't see any anomalies. They just reported the card as they expected it to be. So if they were shown like a, uh, a red six of spades, they reported it either as a, a red six of hearts or as a six of black spades. And so they, they didn't even uh, see the anomaly. They just saw the cards as, as though they were normal. 
And then after continuing to show people these cards, they noticed something curious. A significant portion of their participants started to get very anxious and they seemed very distressed. Um, they called this that their, their participants were experiencing a disruption. And, and one of their participants even, you know, blurted out that, you know, my God, I, I can't tell if that's a playing card or what that is. I, I don't know what a heart is. I don't know what a spade is. And they, they really seem quite distressed. And this is a, a curious reaction because, you know, why should people care about um, playing cards? But what uh, Jerome Bruner was interested in there was showing how people depend on these um, meaning frameworks for making sense of the world. That is, we have these expected associations that, that we expect to see in the world. So that we expect diamonds are red and clubs are black. And these are really well-trenched associations. Um, and so when they're violated, this creates this distress in us. So this led us to, um, we, we include the study to introduce our idea in uh, what we call a meaning maintenance model. And what we're arguing there is that, that people have a need to maintain a sense of meaning in the world, that we're always trying to feel that everything around us makes sense and that fits according to our expectations of what things mean. Perhaps I should just maybe offer a, a definition of meaning here because meaning is one of those words that's hard to know what it means uh, exactly. Mm -hmm. So broad. Yeah. yeah. And really, I think there's kind of two useful definitions of, of meaning here. But, but one, which people usually call general meaning, is that meaning is just um, really expected associations. That is what ideas we expect to occur, co-occur with any kind of event or thing. So if you, know, you were to think, what does your podcast mean to you? It would be all of the ideas that, that you associate with it, or you know, what does uh, Joe Biden mean to you, or what does COVID mean to you? And it's just all of the different um, associations that, that you would have. And so really what, what meaning is then is these, these relations between, between ideas that we expect. And we can have many, many different ideas that are associated with any given event. And these are organized into these meaning frameworks. So in the study with the playing cards, they were taking a very simple meaning framework that playing cards, you know, there's 13 uh, cards, four suits, two colors, knowing that those associations are so reliably seen, like you really don't encounter black diamonds very often, that uh, they were interested yeah, in seeing what happens when you, when you violate this, this sense of meaning. And so in our model, what um, we're arguing is that because people are trying to maintain meaning, they become really bothered and or experience a disruption when uh, they encounter something that uh, seems meaningless, at least that they're uh, that violates the uh, expected associations that they have with that. So we have argued that there are a few different kinds of responses that uh, that people make when this happens. Two of these responses have been very well studied in, in the literature and they go back you know, to the, the 1950s. For instance, in the 1950s, there was this uh, Swiss developmental psychologist, Jean Piaget. And, and he was interested in how, you know, little kids go about making sense of the world because in many ways, the world doesn't make much sense to a little kid because it's a lot of it's very new to them. So he's interested in, well, what happens when, the, you know, a kid encounters something that doesn't make sense, that is new to them? And he argued there's like two different reactions that, that, um, that the kids will have there. Uh, one, which he calls uh, assimilation. I prefer the term faking meaning. And uh, this is when you encounter something that doesn't make sense, you force it into your existing meaning framework so that it seems to make sense. And this is what happened in Jerome Bruner's playing card study, that, that people didn't see an anomaly. They, you know, they would see a, 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 a red six of spades as, uh, as, as a six of hearts. That's how they, that's how they would see it. So that's one reaction that we, we just, pre, we see the world as we want to see it. Right. And so we have these anomalies out there and we, we just force them into it so that, um, that they, uh, that fit they, our model. Uh, yeah, exactly. And a second, uh, response he had, he calls, uh, accommodation where, uh, I prefer the term making meaning. Um, and that if you have something that doesn't make sense, you can then change your meaning framework. So that uh, after seeing these playing cards where you have, you know, red spades, 
at some point people were like, oh, I understand this deck of cards includes red spades, mm. um, that they actually sort of change their understanding of uh, at least this particular deck of cards. So these are these, these two reactions that have been studied many different ways. They've also been studied, you know, in terms of uh, how people make sense of traumatic life events. When, when things happen to them, they kind of undermine their, their existing understanding of what life is all about and that people have to make these changes to, to their, their meaning frameworks. But the thing with this, the second response of um, making meaning is that it's, it's really difficult to do. It's, it's really time consuming and effortful to do. And this, this paper, 1949 paper um, by Jerome Bruner, it was, uh, it was picked up, it was noticed by this uh, philosopher of science um, named Thomas Kuhn, who is interested in how like scientific knowledge progresses. What he argues is that when, you know, scientists have these theories and they, they encounter, you know, new facts that are at odds with these theories, they, they have to change their theories. But this isn't something that they can easily do. Actually, um, Max Planck uh, once sort of famously said that science progresses one funeral at a time, meaning that scientists will often die with their theories, own theories, rather than update them with, with the new information, that we are just so dependent on these meaning frameworks that recreate, that they're really hard to change, that we become very dependent on, on these, these meaning frameworks. And for scientists, you know, their whole life might be dedicated to a particular theory. That's really hard for them to, um, to change it. Mm -hmm. So what we're interested in, in our model is, well, what happens, yeah, when people uh, experience this meaning threat, something that doesn't make sense. And if they don't have the time and resources available to, to make new meaning out of it, to, to understand it, what do they do? Mm -hmm. And uh, what we propose here is that people seek meaning somewhere else. Then the idea is that we need to feel that things make sense. That's the, uh, that's just sort of the, the default state we feel in a need to be in. And when we don't feel this. We have this deep sense of uncertainty. It's deeply unsettling and, and alienating, um, creates a lot of uh, existential anxiety. And so uh, what we argue is that another response when people encounter something that doesn't make sense is that they turn to those other as aspects of their life that, that give them meaning. So they turn to something else that makes sense and they uh, increase their commitment to it. They sort of double down on their existing beliefs, which kind of ground them in another meaning framework that, that makes sense again. So they can return to that feeling that the world makes sense, everything's okay. And this can be in something completely unrelated to the uh, initial problem that they encounter. So that's kind of in a nutshell what, what our meaning maintenance model is all about. So is there a, a specific example that comes to mind that from a, from a study that is a good example of you know someone shoring up meaning from one threat into another arena? Sure. My, my favorite study, at least one that uh, we had conduct conducted, uh, Travis Prue and myself, uh, we had conducted this study actually after we had written this paper where we were arguing that, you know, so many different psychological phenomena fit this idea that we have. Although a big challenge with, with our model is that it's a, it's a very abstract model and that there's, you know, there already exists other theories that have predicted these different responses that people have to uh, to meaning threats within the limits of their uh, of these other theories. So, just some example theories like cognitive dissonance is a theory where that you know when people encounter something that um, doesn't make sense in their own behavior, that they they change the way that they think about themselves in order for it uh, to make sense. But we wanted to come up with a way of threatening people's meaning that didn't fit with any of these other existing theories. And so we thought about it for a while. And then we thought, oh, we're going to expose people to something that looks impossible. We're going to expose people to a real life magic trick. Uh, what we did is we had people, they came into a lab and they're interacting with an experimenter and they were completing some questionnaires and the experimenter kept handing them the next questionnaire. And then at one moment, sort of unexpected to the participants, we swapped the experimenters just outside of their view with another person who didn't look anything like the original person, but was wearing the exact same outfit. Mm. 
and um, a little little gaslighting going on. <laughs> exactly, some uh, some major gaslighting going on, and and remarkably, um, uh, over ninety percent of our participants don't notice, at least mm. consciously notice, that they're now dealing with uh, with another person. Um, although, from what our results show, that at some level they noticed something wasn't right. Mm -hmm. And uh, they had the, this feeling that something wasn't right, something they, they, they couldn't make sense of. After they had this experience, we gave people this, um, this measure that's been used in, in many other studies that, that uh, finds that yeah, when people feel this threat to themselves, they become more likely to try to defend the status quo. That is, uh, in this case here, that um, they want to punish someone who has broken rules. Mm. With the idea that uh, you know, if 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 we have rules, we expect rules to be followed. They um, impose a set of order on the world. So when people are feeling kind of unsettled here, something's going on. I don't know what it is. They can sort of ground themselves again by imposing this set of order here that that um, people who break the rules need to be punished. And yeah, and that's exactly what we found in this study. That um, despite the people had no conscious awareness that anything untoward had just happened to them. They uh, sh showed this, this reaction of wanting to punish rule breakers more. And we, we showed this in three separate studies. It seems to be uh, a reliable effect. And I was uh, really, this is probably the, the, the study that I've been most excited about in my career, because at the time we thought, there's just no way this should work out. I just, at least intuitively have, you know, I don't have any, you know, conscious awareness of ever, you know, wanting to react to things like this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But it made sense according to our theory, and we thought we would gamble and, and go for it. And yeah, and it, and it worked out in this way. Wow. And yeah, and, and the participants just, it, it was really quite funny how they really had no idea that this person had changed. We had uh, one participant who came in, and they actually were friends with the, the second experimenter, the one that they got changed into. And so we just changed into the second experimenter and the person's like, oh my God, I am so out of it today. I, you know, I didn't even recognize you. Um, and they completely showed this, you know, faking meaning response. It's like mm. seeing a, a, seeing a card for the color you assume it to be. Mm -hmm. it, just assuming that. Fit they, their model. Yeah. Yeah. They, they forced it to make sense. So how big an effect is it there? I mean, that's a relatively minor switch, but I'm, yeah, so I'm curious, like, yeah, how big an effect? Yeah, we see a, uh, a significant change in their attitude. It's not like a night or day change. It's not like mm -hmm. um, they are uh, now responding completely differently than how they normally respond. It's mm -hmm. people become just a little, a little bit more, a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And, and in general, what we find is, yeah, that people become a little bit more of an exaggerated version of themselves here that, um, they, they double down on their existing attitudes. So, um, and people can do it in different ways so that liberal people become super liberals after, uh, this kind of experience and conservative people become super conservative. Mm -hmm. Like it just, it pushes them more in this direction that they already are in. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to the, um, uh, the definition of meaning, you know, we can use meaning in a big sense as in like our life has meaning or we feel that, you know, we're afraid that life is meaningless. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious how you see that as comparing to kind of the small granular definition of meaning being, you know, having stability of, of one's worldview for, for specific domains. Is, is it maybe that the, the big sense of meaning is kind of the accumulation or combination of the smaller uh, definitions of meaning? Yeah, that's, um, that's a great question. Um, before I was giving a, a, a one definition of meaning, which is typically called general meaning, the, the big meaning that you're talking to here uh, is often called a sense of existential meaning. Mm. And I think it's still based on the same underlying structure of, of expected ideas going together, with the difference being that when people talk about meaning in life and, and existential meaning, they are connecting another set of meanings to, to these ideas. And these are meanings that connect us to te teleological concerns that sort of transcend our everyday lives. They connect us to ideas about having a sense of purpose is, is a key element in this existential meaning, um, to having a, uh, a sense of significance that, that we matter in the world. And uh, 
also just a, a sense of value, you know, uh, what we desire to have. And uh, so th these are uh, just another set of kinds of meanings or mm -hmm. kind of ideas that, that we link to things. And uh, it's um, still, I think it's a very similar idea that when people have a crisis of meaninglessness uh, in their lives, they're usually talking about um, more of these sort of existential concerns um, and that people have a desire then to sort of reestablish this, this set of meaning in terms of finding a way to pursue a, a meaningful life. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's, uh, it's a similar idea that it's just linking ideas together. But when we talk about meaning in life, it's just, uh, yeah, these are more transcendent uh, teleological kinds of meanings. Yeah, it's almost like we desire this stable framework that, you know, that we, and then it's almost like our existential sense of meaning is like ourself being part of that framework you know in a, in a in a big sense so exactly it seems like there's something about the the self being part of the the framework e exactly so i i think you know there's really three main kinds of meanings that that we are uh aspiring to maintain one is this meanings of ourselves yeah i want to understand who i am um, why i'm doing the things that i'm doing we also uh care about the meanings in the world we want to understand you know what what the world is like and then we want to understand our place within that world, how we fit in that world, how ourselves fit into that world. And we are trying to maintain these sort of key sources of meaning as we aspire for a meaningful life. Mm -hmm. So there could be so-called, you know, that the so-called existential crises of various sorts, uh, you know, some so-called midlife crises might be one type of that. Mm -hmm. Another might be adolescent angst. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you see these kinds of crises relating to the threats to meaning? Yes. So I think, you know, as we go about living our lives that uh, we, we sometimes encounter this, these events in our life that just really threaten the sense of meaning. And it's quite common for people to experience these at those two key times in life that you, that you just brought up. And so uh, adolescent angst is uh, what I think is the uh, existential crisis that people have at a young age in, in adolescence or uh, early adulthood. And I'm a cultural psychologist by trade. I, I, in addition to studying meaning, I'm interested in um, how cultures vary in the ways that they go about trying to find meaning in their lives. And, and one striking finding from the anthropological literature is that this idea of adolescent angst is not a, a cultural universal by any means. And in most small scale societies, they don't have this idea that adolescent is a time of chaos and, and turbulence. Um, every society recognizes adolescence as a distinct phase in life, but the idea that it's a turbulent, chaotic time or of a lot of angst is not by any means um, universal. The kinds of cultures that have more of this adolescent angst are those where um, that are more industrialized, uh, individualistic societies where people have a lot of different options about the kind of life they're going to lead. And in adolescence, this is when you have this, this first existential crisis, potential existential crisis is trying to figure out what life am I going to lead? And when you have lots of options, it can be kind of overwhelming uh, in trying to figure mm -hmm. out what is the, the right life that I'm going to lead. And people might try out various sorts of things. People in uh, small scale societies, uh, at least in terms of what they're going to do for a career, this is not something that they have a, a lot of options. They're going to do what their parents did and, and what everyone else in their society does. It's not something they have to figure out. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're from a small scale farming society, what are you going to do with your life? You're going to farm. That's like really the, the only option. But in individualistic industrialized societies, what are you going to do with your life? Well, there are so many different possibilities that, that people can pursue. And in trying to figure out this, what life am I going to lead, that uh, adolescents go through a, a great deal of angst as they, as they try to figure this out. And this has been getting worse over time as this period of adolescence has been expanding, this period of time when people are in this sort of preparatory phase in life. We mm -hmm. now call it emerging adulthood or, or failure to launch um, and the idea that um, people are now in their 20s or even into their 30s still haven't really figured out what life it is that, that they're going to lead. And, and uh, if you look at sort of the 
there's some common benchmarks that have been, you know, used before for what is achieving adulthood. And it's things like, you know, finishing your training and education, getting a, uh, you know, a, a secure position, um, uh, moving out of your parents' home, getting your own place, um, yeah, getting married and having kids, although mm-hmm. this last two maybe aren't universally pursued anymore. Um, and, and those have just been getting later and later as, as time goes on. And the people are in this longer period of this sort of existential angst where they're trying to figure out, you know, what, what life are they going to lead? Yeah, I've heard that referred to as the paradox of choice. Yeah, there was a book called The Paradox of Choice yes. that, that talked about that idea. And I can definitely feel that in, in my life where, you know, we just have so much choice and, and freedom to make decisions about, you know, where are you going to live? Uh, what kind of job are you going to pursue? Who who are you going to date? All these kinds of choices. And that can be stressful. Freedom freedom is a stressful thing. Yeah, yeah that's um, this is something that the uh, the original existential philosophers um, uh, used to talk a lot about. So like Jean-Paul Sartre, you know, would say that, well, life is is the what the choices that you make. And that, you know, you, it's up to you to figure out what kind of life to, to, to live. And that, that sounds kind of exhilarating. Wow, like, you know, <laughs> so many different choices I get to choose. That, that's so exciting. But at the same time, we're, we're responsible for all of the choices that we make then. We're responsible for the, the life that we lead. Mm-hmm. And that brings with it a, a, a lot of anxiety. And I think if you go back in Western history to, in the past, back to the, you know, the medieval era, there really weren't nearly as many choices um, to be made that people would largely inherit the occupation of their, their parents. That was, that was really quite common. Uh, arranged marriages were, were still quite common uh, uh, in Europe and, and elsewhere around the world. Um, so you didn't, you know, this, who am I going to spend my life with? And also in, in at least much of Europe there, there wasn't really a, a competing much of a competing sense of which god should you worship it was kind of the you know the town usually virtually everyone shared the same religion you didn't have to figure that out and now people have to yeah, f- figure out you know what career there's thousands of different possible careers um, they're trying to find uh, uh, you know a partner and they're on apps with again thousands of different options so many different ways of getting it wrong mm-hmm. and um, and uh, society has been secularizing in a way that people are turning away from uh, traditional religions. But interestingly, they're not not that many of them are turning towards atheism. That's increasing a little bit. The 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 what's increasing the most though is people are becoming what they call spiritual but not religious, where they're kind of creating their own spiritual set of beliefs. You know, this smorgasbord approach to you know the hereafter that uh, I'm going to you know believe in horoscopes maybe, and mm-hmm. maybe some crystals, maybe I'll meditate, um, you know, maybe do some yoga, that, that people will have this sort of potpourri collection of, of different uh, uh, spiritual concerns. And, and again, it's just like all the more things that people are responsible for, that they're responsible for all these different aspects of their lives, and now they're even responsible for the hereafter, that uh, they are choosing the, the path that they are going to take. And this brings with it just uh, a huge amount of responsibility, and what comes with that is this existential anxiety. Do you think uh, it's true that by having all these choices, it's almost like we're we're drawn to the fact of how arbitrary our choices are. And, and that can almost, that can feel like a, a threat to meaning uh, of sensing that. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great point. I mean, I, I often look back at uh, life choices. So my own um, adolescent angst experience or existential crisis that I had, it was when I was 19 years old and I had started off at university as a, as a business student. And I, uh, I lucked out at the age of 19. I got this great internship through this international exchange program where I got to work for a, a marketing company in, in Helsinki, Finland. And this had been at my, that time, you know, my dream job. I thought, wow, I want to get into this international marketing. And I'm so lucky to have this. And anyways, I, um, once I had this job, I immediately had this, this very strong feeling that this isn't the right job for me. Um, and I switched to psychology at that point. And I often look back and think, well, what if I hadn't done that switch that, you know, this, the whole life path that I am on, that I've been on since then mm-hmm. would be changed. I, I um, have a, a very different career. I have a, have a, a different social network. I would be 
surely, you know, have many more business friends and now I have more sort of professor friends. Uh, I wouldn't have met um, my wife. I, um, I would probably end up living in a different place. It's, um, you know, this one decision and, and I'm living a, a very different life. And, and that's, yeah, that's kind of uh, unsettling to think about sometimes. <laughs> Just, um, yeah. I mean, how many of these decisions are we, we making in life? Like right. how what, many... is, what does it mean? Yeah, what, is, what does it all mean? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I'm curious if you have examples from your personal life that you see as related to the meaning maintenance model. And I could give a few examples if you want, but I'm curious if, you, if some come to mind for you. Examples of maybe, you know, having meaning threatened in one sphere and then shoring it up in another. Yeah. Well, one example from my own life is when I had my second existential crisis, which was my uh, midlife crisis, which I had at 48, and I, I got divorced. And um, that was, that's a very unsettling um, time when uh, life as I knew it, all the different aspects of my life, I've kind of interpreted through the, 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 the lens of, of, of being married to this particular person. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was all very upended. And what I um, recognized that I was doing a lot of in the, in the immediate aftermath of that uh, was I had become uh, a lot more nostalgic. And I, I found myself visiting a lot of places uh, from my past and sort of reflecting on all these memories from my past. And, and my reactions actually are, are, are not unusual at all. And this is a very common reaction that people have when they're feeling that their lives are, are disrupted. And the, so they, they seek out nostalgia. And I think what nostalgia does here is that it restores a, a sense of meaning because you're kind of reflecting on your life story, on, on who you are as a person and, and these different events that you had in your past that, that, that are part of you and are, uh, that you know, are, are part of the reason that you have been uh, came, became the person that you are today. Mm -hmm. And that's what you find is that when people are feeling, yeah, if they're feeling lonelier or if they're just feeling um, anxious or they're feeling a little meaningless, they become a little more um, nostalgic. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I don't think it's a coincidence that right now it's said that we're living in the age of nostalgia again, that everything is retro, right? That um, we see this on, on, movies that are coming out there are a, a lot of remakes of, of movies in the past whether it be things like uh, um, uh, ghostbusters or uh, things like stranger things isn't isn't a remake but you know a big part of the uh of the show is is this the, the the setting of the 80s and sort of revisiting this and i think people are people are quite anxious these days this is a, this is an anxious anxious time mm -hmm. and uh that this is one thing that we're collectively doing is turning to the past uh, and in doing so um, sort of, you know, reflecting on these earlier chapters of our life story. A small note here. In a previous episode, I talked to Janine Lasaleta about the psychological factors involved in nostalgia. We examined why it is that nostalgia is so powerful and why we find it so meaningful. One thing we examined was how feelings of nostalgia can make us more carefree with our money. That being one reason companies like to try to use nostalgia in their advertising. Okay, back to the interview. For examples from my life, because uh, I, I can definitely feel the things you talk about in, in my life. And one example was kind of similar to yours. Like if I've had an argument with my wife or if I feel socially isolated for some other reason, mm -hmm. I can feel a desire to shift from social things to more intellectual pursuits as kind of a need to compensate and put my, you know, kind of put my a uh, sense of meaning in, in other things right. a little bit. And then the vice versa, you know, if I feel like I'm not doing much, you know, on these intellectual pursuits, or if I feel like I've, you know, made a mistake, or if I feel like I'm not, I don't really have a sense of community there, I might, I'll go back the other way and focus more on social things and kind of, you know, so that's just an example yeah. of like, we, we can switch our like focus of, of where we get, where we get our sense of meaning from of what's, what's important, you know, throughout our lives and even like throughout the week or whatever. Exactly. That's, uh, Th those are great examples of it that yeah we we just need to feel that life has meaning and we can get that through many different ways and it's just you know what current thoughts are in our head that our current thoughts we we want to make sense and be some aspect of ourselves that that give our lives meaning and that can be satisfied by so many uh different different ways and uh and people have you know people are all unique they, they all have you know, these unique meaning frameworks, unique things that, that give their lives meaning. And so people turn to different things when they're, mm -hmm. yeah, 
confronting these these challenges of life. Am I understanding correctly that what set your uh, your model your your theory apart from some other comparable theories is you know you're focusing on the fluidity and the you know kind of the equal nature of of where people can find their meaning that it's very fluid. Am I am, was I getting that right? I think what what our model is is showing is that yeah that people can get there they can respond to a meaning threat in a very fluid way by turning to a very different domain of life. You don't have to, so for instance, um, there's theories about uh, needing belongingness and what a lot of um, findings show that when people feel, you know, lonely, like so that their belongingness is threatened, they try to seek out other relationships as a way of, you know, uh, responding to that perceived lack of interpersonal connection. And um, I, I think that's very true that people uh, definitely do that. But um, what we're showing is that yeah, you can satisfy the uh, the underlying need for meaning that's been disrupted by um, by feeling lonely or interpersonal rejection by turning to something completely different, something that gives you a, a feelings of certainty in some other areas, uh, or something that just reflects on core aspects of yourself. You can affirm yourself, and you can um, dispel those bothersome feelings that originated from feeling interpersonal rejection it originated in this one sort of specific domain, but can be tackled by a very different domain. And yes, and that's what's uh, unique about our theory. A small note here, the meaning maintenance model has been compared to terror management theory, which is a theory that posits that our existential fears around death and mortality play a big role in our behavior and our desire to form meaning. The fluidity aspect of the meaning maintenance model is one thing that makes it unique and sets it apart. If you'd like to read more about that, I'd recommend reading the Wikipedia entry for terror management theory. It mentions the meaning maintenance model there and how it relates. Also, Stephen Heine and his colleagues this year did an analysis of the terror management literature. Back to the interview. So I, when I was young, a young man, I had some serious mental struggles. And so I've spent a good amount of time thinking about these kinds of topics and about how we build narratives and stories um, as ways to you know create meaning in our lives. And you know, in a kind of way that's kind of taken for granted because we we have these underlying narratives about our our place in the world that we don't really examine that allow us to you know lead uh, so called normal or, or functional lives. You know, the, these you know, narratives around who we are and our relationship to the world, our relationship to others. And one thing that strikes me there is it just seems like there's so many different kinds of stories we can create. There's almost no limit on the the kinds of stories humans can create because we are such storytellers. That's such a part of who we are. And I, and I see that as related to the meaning maintenance model ideas in the sense that we can construct so many narratives that give us stability about our place in the world. And it's almost like there's multiple solutions in a game theory sense of, of forming different narratives that allow us to feel comfortable and not just swimming in constant chaos and anxiety. And, and, right. and, and we all have that as a major goal, you know, to reach that kind of stability and not feel anxious. Right. So I'm curious what you think of all that. Do you see our drive to construct stories and narratives as related to our drive to construct meaning? Yes, that's a great point. Uh, I, I definitely think so. And that um, these meaning frameworks that we have about the, the world get can get very complex or the ones that we have about ourself get, get very complex. And they often can have some sort of contradictory parts. So if you, know, if you just think of like, you know, who am I? And you realize that, well, okay, um, yesterday I was uh, with my college friends and is acting quite silly. And then uh, then today I was at work and acting quite professional. And then I was driving and I was, you know, screaming at obscenities at the passenger in the car beside me because he cut me off. And, you know, that looking at this, we see, well, what is the common thread here that um, you know don't don't seem to be uh, very consistent, or even just comparing, you know, me now versus what I was like in high school, or um, or you know, yesterday I was dead set on um, you know losing some weight, but today here I'm sitting in front of the TV with some Hagen Dazs. Like in many ways, we're we're not very consistent, and I think this is the um, the key value of stories here, as that we rely on to organize this information about ourselves and, and, and about our world that I, I think and there's there's a lot of theories in psychology that, that emphasizes that we experience the world through stories. 
that we have a story about uh, about who we are and we have a story about what, what what the world is like and what the nice thing about the these stories is that they can simplify they can connect all these disparate parts together that we can sort of edit our stories kind of you know kind of erase the parts that don't fit in so well and you know make things fit a a, a certain theme Mm-hmm. And I think then that people really try to defend these stories that these like we're committed to the stories like this mm-hmm. is who I am like I, I'm committed to this idea and and so yeah if you in, encounter something that's at odds with that well you you need to defend your story and you need to uh, f- find focus on another aspect of your life story that that fits with this this theme that that you think captures the the real you. And yeah, I think we're doing this but when we tell stories about ourselves and when we're telling stories about the world, like what is the world like? We we are are, are telling a story and we and we want it to be consistent. And mm-hmm. what's remarkable is just how different people's stories can be. You know, if you just think like you know, what are people's stories about the the COVID pandemic? You know, and yeah, you know, some people see this as, you know, this is a, a huge threat to their their well being and their and their loved ones and a big you know, a challenge to society. Other people think this is, you know, all overblown or this is a hoax or, or um, billionaires are, are, are trying to control us with, by putting microchips in us. Mm-hmm. That people have a story that is trying to connect these different uh, events that are happening to us. And even though really you would think it's the same events that are happening in, in the world, like at some level, there must be some objective reality, but we perceive these events through this the, the lenses of the story that we're telling in and um, we tell very different stories but we want our stories to be consistent when you encounter new information it's got to be find a way to weave that into weave that into the story that we're telling mm-hmm. so i uh, i focus a good amount on the podcast on uh, us versus them political polarization mm-hmm. and one thing that strikes me in that area that seems kind of underexamined is how stressful it can be to have big conflicts in, in how we, or big differences in how we perceive uh, reality and, and our narratives. And so aside from the more obvious and superficial aspects of disagreeing with people and arguing, arguing over important topics, I think there's this kind of more fundamental anxiety around the, the, the meaning maintenance type ideas that, you know, we look around and we see others around us, our neighbors, the other people in our society is, is believing such vastly different things. And just the knowledge that we see that meaning can be so hard to establish that reality can be so hard to agree upon. It can be existentially stressful for the reasons that we've talked about. You know, it's kind of like the cards having a different color, but on a really large scale, you know, we look around and we just perceive this kind of chaos of of meaning around us. Yes. And, and that, that to me, it strikes me that that could be feeding into the polarization in the sense that that threat to meaning that we perceive can make us really want to double down on our ideas and be like, oh, we're going to, we're going to decide this once and for all, this is the the narrative and this is the right narrative. And, and we, uh, you know, latch more strongly onto our, our narratives and such. And, and that adds to the, the polarization and such. And, and I'm curious if you'd agree with that playing a role in the, in the polarization cycle. Yeah, I think that's, that, that's a great point. I think that um, this is sort of one underappreciated cost of, of polarization. I mean, I, you know, polarization makes it makes it hard to govern. It's uh, it, it can lead to violence. There's a, a lot of discussion on these sort of familiar parts about it, but I think just as you were saying here, that you know the the fact that we don't all share the same story about things. We don't, in some ways, we're not really living in the the same shared reality anymore. That this can be really undermining for us, and it's because you know we. We, we want to feel certain. We want to feel that our understanding of the world is right. So that way we feel that we can predict things and we can have control over things and we can act effectively. But we never really know what's right and what's true. We don't, we don't have any direct access to that. So we have to infer it. And one thing that makes us feel much more confident that our stories are right is when everyone around us agrees with us. If it's like if everyone's agreeing that this is the way things are, then yeah, you, you, you feel much more certain. I've got it all figured out. My understanding of the world is right. I know how to act. I know the rules of the game. I know what I need to do. But when we find out that half of the country uh, has a completely different story for, for what's going on, that, um, that these stories don't overlap much at all. And so here we are trying to you know, feel the sense that, yes, uh, you know, I, 
I know what's happening. I, I, I know what to do in the world. And now it's just being undermined by the fact that, well, the, there are these other people that are saying the exact opposite of, mm-hmm. of what I'm saying. How can I be so sure that I'm right when half the country says the opposite? And I think that's just, I think this is contributing to this, this level of um, uncertainty uh, and anxiety that's, uh, that's, that's in the world today. And um, this polarization here, which is, uh, it's been especially increasing in, in the U.S. It's, um, there's a number of different ways of measuring polarization so that the U.S. in particular has showed this, 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 this big jump lately. And I think this is contributing to, uh, yeah, all of the tensions and, and the underlying anxieties that people are experiencing. A note here, if you're interested in learning more about polarization and how it's been increasing in the world, the episode before this one was a talk about that. Back to the interview. I'm curious if you have any thoughts about uh, how your these ideas map over to mental illness. Uh, you know, for example, it's known that immigrants have higher rates of mental illness than average, and this can be seen to relate maybe to meaning maintenance ideas, and that it can be harder for immigrants to construct meaning in, in a pretty alien environment. They're they're more aware of, you know, the kind of the chaos and the, and the conflict conflicts and meaning than other people are who, who live in more in this, the, the, um, social majority, uh, culture and such. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious if you have any thoughts you'd care to share about the mapping over of those two things. Yeah. I think, um, immigrants, uh, are often experiencing another kind of, uh, existential crisis in that, um, so I'm as a cultural psychologist, my field has a a slogan, a, a mantra, that says culture and self make each other up. And that's the idea that um, we live in this sort of ecology of cultural meanings that, uh, that tell us what is valued, what is appropriate, what is you know, forbidden, what, what is tolerated. And uh, these are the norms that we live in. And, and that shapes our psychology. It, it shapes the way that we perceive the world, make sense of it, and, and um, try to work towards, um, you know, leading a, a satisfying and meaningful life. And the challenge that immigrants uh, face is that their selves have been shaped by one particular culture, and then they move to another different cultural framework where things can mean, what the meanings around them can be really quite different. And they're no longer a good match. Their self is no longer a good match for the, uh, the cultural environment around them. And um, they go through what, what is termed culture shock is the experience that, that people go through this distressing experience after they've moved to a new place um, that, that can persist for uh, up to you know, a, a few years, this period where one really isn't a good match with the, uh, the, the cultural meanings uh, around one. And, and this is something that's, that, that's very alienating and it creates a lot of distress so that immigrants um, have more health problems um, while they're going through this uh, culture shock period. This, this is like undermining their physical health and it's undermining um, their mental health. And it's only you know, over time where they, their self adjusts to this new set of uh, meanings that they are, are, are living with that they get over this 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 period of, of culture shock, and um, this the amount of culture shock that uh, an immigrant uh, experiences is one thing that predicts it is just how different are the two cultures that they are moving between, and that uh, if you're moving between two uh, similar cultures, it's not that hard to. Um, uh, to to learn this new meaning framework, but if you're you know moving between two very different cultures that differ in many aspects, then this is uh, particularly challenging, and people from more distant cultures have have more of this this culture shock. Yeah, and they say they also say that you know kids who who move around a good amount when they're young are more likely to have uh, you know emotional and, and psychological issues, and that seems related to that too. I you know I, I can just imagine. Well, I, I definitely remember I had uh, one of my psychological issues started when I had a panic panic attack my first day of high school because I went to a new, basically a new new high school system mm-hmm. and with new people. And then also in college, the stress of going to college and new people and new environment, you know, those, those are all stressful situations that make us, you know, force us to have to uh, build up new, new sets of meanings and, and right. such. You know. Yeah, those kinds of transitions uh, uh, can create a, a, a lot of distress, and I and and I mean mental illness is uh, more likely to 
the experience when people are going through these the uh, kinds of anxieties that come mm -hmm. from the experiencing these meaning threats that um, if people are feeling that their life doesn't really make much sense uh, if people are feeling that their life is uh, is low in that sense of meaning these people are are more vulnerable to depression, anxiety, and substance abuse, and and self harm. That there's there's real consequences. There's real you know there's a lot on the line for for feeling that you're living a uh, a meaningful life, and um and these kinds of big transitions like that are, are the kinds of things that can you know pose some challenges for us. When it comes to the best reading, you'd recommend for people who want to dig into these concepts more what what would you recommend maybe your 2006 paper or what else yes in addition to our 2006 paper uh i like a 2010 paper that i wrote with travis prue called uh, the frog in kierkegaard's beer and and this paper just the title of it's re referring to this observation by um by soren kierkegaard who is who is contrasting experience of death with the surprise that you would feel, you know, if you were drinking a beer and you would discover a live frog in it, just it's, uh, sorry, you know, it's the same kind of thing, this thing that we can't fully process and, and make sense of. And anyways, in that paper, we sort of describe um, uh, a more up, uh, slightly more up to date version of our meaning maintenance uh, model. Um, I also like a paper also done with Travis Prue. Um, in 2009 called uh, Connections from Kafka and where we were ex exploring how um, when people feel threats to their meaning, uh, including by reading, you know, surreal stories that don't make sense. And Kafka was, was a master at that, like eliciting this mm -hmm. very alienating feeling of like, what is going on? Right. That people are primed to seek out meaning and they can actually learn new things uh, a little better, that they pick up on some patterns that they are less likely to detect when they're not feeling this, this sense of um, meaninglessness. Well, and um, I'm working on a book right now. It's, it's not going to be out for another, uh, supposed to be out next year. It's supposed to be done next year. Uh, I'll need a good tailwind to, to, to finish it then. Um, but it's, uh, the working title is called Navigating the Absurd, um, the Science of Existentialism, and where I'm exploring really the kind of ideas we've been talking about here in this, this podcast, just how this, uh, this desire for meaning um, that we have, how it shapes the ways that, um, that we interact with the world and that we uh, try to make sense of things, try to make sense of herself, and we try to pursue a meaningful life. Yeah, the, the, uh, you had gotten on the subject of, of literature, uh, you know, changing our worldview and, and using these kind of meaning-threatening situations and, and narratives to, to make us see the world in new ways. And there's positive aspects of that, you know, like, for example, that's why people like, uh, you know, that one of the benefits of hallucinogenics is, is kind of shift, uh, breaking up people's way of seeing the world and making them see it in new ways. And, mm -hmm. and also in art, like you mentioned, uh, Kafka, and I think of Flannery O'Connor, you know, when she, one of her things was trying to have these shocking endings to some of her short stories that would make people see the world and in a different way. And she, she had a religious uh, goal there uh -huh. because she was Catholic, but you know, it, it, the same idea applied where she was basically trying to kind of shatter people's, uh, you know, threaten their meaning a bit and make them see the world as the, you know, the mysterious and the, and the mind blowing yeah. thing it was, you know, and, and, huh. and in that sense. Interesting. Yeah. Well, I think, um, uh, one just, I, I do think art is, um, an especially powerful way for eliciting, this feeling, the feeling that we get when things don't make sense. Um, I, I, I like to label that feeling the uncanny. It's something that, that Freud called it too. This, this, it's often described as a feeling of the unfamiliar familiar. So that uh, you're sensing something that feels normal, but there's something not quite right. And this is what the, the, the surrealists, I think, did this especially well. Um, uh, paintings by like uh, Rene Magritte or, or Salvador Dali, um, you know, films like uh, David Lynch, I think is especially good at uh, eliciting this feeling. And I think art is, is just, you know, so good at eliciting this emotional reaction. And it really, I think, is stemming from this, the emotion that we get, that feeling that something's not right. 
and that, that that's prompting mm-hmm. this. And uh, your point about um, yeah hallucinogenic drugs, I think, is is a great one in there. Um, yeah, now it looks like uh, we're about to looks like some of these um, uh, some of these drugs are going to be approved. Looks like um, get FDA approval for use in in therapy, and um, why there's so much excitement around them is because they really do seem to be able to have this enduring change of how you make sense of your life, how you make sense of your world, and the existing kinds of um, meds that uh, people are prescribed when they're uh, facing mental uh, illness challenges are, um, you know, ones that you you know, need to be regularly taking these antidepressants um, that, you know, you need to take every day to help people to function at their best. And whereas these um, uh, initial trials that are coming out of these these studies with um, um, the psychedelic drugs, um, s- such as, uh, well, uh, psilocybin and uh, uh, LSD and MDMA and ketamine, mm-hmm. that people are having these sort of lasting changes from uh, from having this one very intense experience when they, I think, are connecting themselves to some new transcendent concerns that they hadn't realized before, and they are perceiving their life differently, and they have memories for those, that those, mm-hmm. those um, seem to have provide some lasting changes. And um, yeah, I think that, so there's a lot of excitement about the potential that uh, that these um, drugs have in helping people to to cope with um, yeah the, the many challenges that that this new era of anxiety is is throwing at us. Well, yeah, I think the interesting thing about the threats to meaning is you know it, it can it can be negative, of course, but there's also an excitement and a mystery about it because it opens up these new uh, you know n- new ways of viewing the world as as exciting and mysterious and strange and and that can have a negative you know you can view that negatively or as scary or you can view it uh on the other side of the coin as well that's exciting that that's making the the world a a wild uh place now Mm -hmm. in in ways that it wasn't before for for some people so there's you know different sides of the of the threat to meaning coin i guess right yeah and i think that's that's important that um that these new therapies are being conducted in a therapeutic context where there is someone there to help lead people through mm-hmm. their experience because yeah, there, there, there is some risk um, to people just that uh, they talk about set and setting mattering uh, a great deal when people are uh, exploring with these um, mm-hmm. uh, psychedelic drugs that if they're in the wrong mindset, it can be a, a very frightening to sort of devastating uh, experience. So it can go both ways. And um, that's why I think, that um, all of these uh, trials that are going on are, are together with uh, guides and used in the context of a guide. Yeah, yeah, guide for sure. Guide you through. Yeah, bad trips, a uh, real thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, well, this has been great, Stephen. Thanks a lot for your time, and um, appreciate you coming on. All right, thanks a lot for having me. It was a lot of fun. That was Professor Stephen Heine talking about the meaning maintenance model. One of the big takeaways for me in examining this research is how threats to meaning might make us cling more to the status quo. In other words, threats to meaning can make us more intolerant of those who violate the rules of our group and make us cling more closely to the rules and stereotypical traits of our group. The reason I initially found Stephen's research was that I was interested in that exact idea, how extreme polarization, in making it more apparent just how much our perceptions of reality can diverge from our neighbors, can make us want to cling more strongly to our group's narratives, and how that itself can be an amplifying effect on polarization. And if you want to read more on that idea, Stephen and his colleague's 2006 paper on the meaning maintenance model goes into more detail on how threats to meaning can be related to people's attempts to reinforce their group identity. I want to thank Matthew Hornsey, who's a group psychology researcher and who I interviewed in a previous episode. He answered some questions I had about this topic and gave me some links to papers that eventually led to me reaching out to Stephen. If you enjoyed this podcast, I'd recommend checking out some other episodes I have on some related topics. For example, one episode is a talk with existential psychologist Kirk Schneider, and in that one we talk about how the strangeness and mystery of existence can affect us psychologically, and how that might also relate to our political conflicts. For more information about this podcast, go to behavior-podcast.com. I have entries for the episodes, and that includes links to papers and other resources we talk about here. If you like this podcast, please share it with your friends and family. The more people listen to it, 
and leave ratings and reviews, the more I'm encouraged to do more interviews. Thanks for listening. Music by Small Skies. Thank you.